as I said in class uh, on Thursday, that I was not going to be on campus um, this week before the midterm. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as, as Luju said, I'm out here in California dealing with as an inter intervention for our friend from Fat Face Rick. Uh, he's somebody that used to know back in the day from Slinging Rocks, and then Mushu knows him from the, the trap circuit. Um, so I, it's a mess out here. I, I, I mean, who, who makes an intervention open bar? This is really stupid and crazy, but um, so they might need to call me and deal with something out there in a second, but I just want to get through uh, this lecture for you guys really quickly. Um, so coming up for you guys on the docket, uh, obviously, this Thursday is the, the midterm exam. Again, that'll be in our main lecture hall at our regular time. Um, and there'll be, you know, everything's posted on Piazza with the practice exam and the, and the study guide. Uh, project 2 is due, uh, the first checkpoint is due tomorrow, um, so Tuesday, October 11th. And then the uh, checkpoint 2 will be due the first Wednesday after uh, fall break when everyone gets back. So again, post on Piazza if you have any questions for any of these. So last class, we were talking about query execution. We were talking about how we can take these different operators that implement these uh, algorithms that we talked about so far, um, and we convert them into a sort of high-level logical plan, which we then convert to a physical plan that specifies the exact implementation of the, of, of the operator, like what, you know, what, what join algorithm we're going to use, what sorting algorithm we're going to use. Um, and so up until now, the entire semester, uh, we've been assuming that the, the queries are being executed by a single worker or a single thread or process, right? There's sort of one execution thing that is, that is processing tuples. So in today's class, we're now going to talk about how we actually execute uh, queries in parallel using multiple workers in the same time within one single uh, database instance, right? And it's, this sort of seems obvious why we want to do this, right? Um, but just to make sure that it's concrete and everyone understand why we're actually spending this time to talk about parallel execution, I want to go sort of, sort of three main points of why this all matters. So the first is that we obviously are going to get potentially better performance running on our, in our database system for, the, for the, the same amount of hardware that we, that we have to procure or deploy for our system. So nowadays you really can't buy and you can't get CPUs, especially at a server level, or server grade, you don't, they, don't, they don't make single threaded CPUs or single core CPUs. So the, in, the way Intel gets better performance, uh, in addition to SIMD and some, other, some of the acceleration stuff we talked about before, is to now give you multiple cores on a single socket. Um, and for Intel, for most of their systems, most of their CPUs, the cores are all uh, homogeneous, meaning they have the same amount of power or computational um, capacity as, as one core versus another. The M1 stuff from Apple, they're starting to have uh, heterogeneous socket CPUs where some cores are fast, some cores are slow. That's, that's sort of where things are going next. But in general, they, they're just giving you more cores. And so if we can take advantage of these cores uh, that we provide on the CPU, um, then we're gonna potentially get higher throughput, meaning we can run more queries and run more transactions, uh, we can complete more of them within a certain amount of time, and then we'll get lower latency meaning the system, the time it takes from when the query shows up in the system from the time it takes to produce a result, that'll get reduced as well. And so as part of this, you're going to get increased responsiveness in the system. So because now when we have multiple threads or multiple workers running in the same time, when say one worker stalls because it has to go to disk and get something, get, you know, get some page, and that's a really slow operation, another worker can keep on running and process the query process another query that has stuff in memory. And so the system doesn't look like, you know, you know it's just, it stalls all the time and it just seems really sluggish. And then so related to all of this is that you're gonna have what is uh, called TCO or total cost of ownership. This will get reduced for your system. Again, because now we can take better, more, you know, full advantage of the hardware that we're given uh, at the CPU or even the disk, um, then we're gonna need fewer machines, we need fewer uh, parts to put in these machines and maintain them need fewer people to maintain these machines. Although if you're running in the cloud, Amazon, Google, Microsoft handle that for you, but even then you, know, you, you pay them money to do that. Um, and of course, all of this is, means that you, you're gonna use less energy potentially because um, you know, every machine has to maintain its own RAM, has to maintain its own disk, all that takes power. But if I can put my, if I can have my system run really, really well on a single box, then maybe I don't need to spread out uh, across multiple machines. Now there'll be, um, We'll get a discussion later in the semester of like 
and there are some cases where you do want to have across multiple machines and this will be called a distributed database. Um, and we may want to do this for performance reasons, availability reasons, re reliability reasons. Um, but for our purposes today, we, we can ignore that. And so I want to make the distinction now uh, between sort of parallel databases and distributed databases. And for the most part, I think this is my definition. And so I, I like to do this sort of compartmentalize what we're talking about today. And then when we talk about distributed databases near Thanksgiving, what, what I mean by that. Um, and the ideas at a high level are the same. Like we want to be able to have multiple workers run in our database system and, and, and process queries and take care of, you know, run transactions. Um, but for today's class, we're mostly going to focus on uh, or we are going to only focus on using a, having multiple workers within a single single server instance, right? So for both distributed databases and parallel databases, to the application, although there may be multiple workers, it's going to appear as a single logical database. Um, and this is sort of that, that logical versus physical independence that we talked about before, where I could write you know one SQL query and I don't care whether the the data system is a column store or a row store, it's going to figure out the best way to execute that, uh, that query and organize my data. So in the same way, we want to be able to have the application be unaware that it, the data may be split across multiple uh, partitions, multiple servers. Uh, and and I, that way, when I, when I scale the system up like vertically or horizontally at bigger machine, more machines, I don't have to rewrite my application. So that's sort of the high level goal what we're trying to do. And you would want to do this for both for a parallel database and a distributed database. So the idea is that the single SQL query that we run on a single thread or a single worker database system will also work in a, in a parallel distributed database system. So just define this distinction between the parallel and distributed, distributed systems uh, for this class. So for a parallel database system, we're going to assume that the the resources, both the disk and computational resources, so CPUs and, and the disk, they're going to be physically close to each other. And that the communication channels between them is going to be both very fast and high speed and also reliable. Meaning if we send a message to another CPU uh, core, another worker running on the same CPU socket, we're going to, for our purposes in this class, we assume that that message is not getting lost. Uh, it may show up in a different order, and we use latching to, to make sure that happens correctly. Um, but it's not like we say we pass a message to one to, from one thread to another that that message disappears. Because if that happens, then you're having you know cataclysmic problems in your in your system, and the whole node is going to crash and go down. Um, so for our purposes, again, for the algorithms and things we'll talk about today, we assume that we can communicate between different workers uh, reliably and very 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 fast. And in some cases, actually read read the memory of, a, of another thread another worker. So I keep doing this. I keep saying thread instead of worker. I'm trying to keep these words uh, sort of separated. I'll explain why in a second, but uh, just know that if I say worker, if I say thread, I really mean worker. Um, and so in a distributed database system, which we'll cover later in the semester, um, that's where the resources could potentially be very far, far apart from each other, meaning different data center, you know, different racks in the same data center, different data centers in the same state, country, uh, different sides of the globe, and so forth, right? And therefore, the communication between them is going to be slower uh, than, than what we'll, we'll assume in a parallel database, but it's also going to be very unreliable, meaning if we send a message, even if we're using TCP, uh, there's no guarantee that our message is actually going to show up. And likewise, there's no guarantee that we'll get a response uh, from the server. So we have to account for that in our, in our algorithms and in, in in how we design our system. So again, for today's class, we're assuming that we're, we're the first one here, we're parallel databases, and it's just going to make our lives a lot easier. But then the same techniques that we can, we're going to talk about today can get applied to the distributed database world. It's just we have to add extra safety protections to make sure that, uh, that to deal with you know, lost messages and so forth. All right, so I want to begin talking about different process models you can have in your implementation of a database system. Um, then we'll talk about how to do query execution in parallel. And again, we'll cover the high-level concepts of how you organize a query plan um, to, to move data or shuffle data between, between different workers. And then we'll finish up talking about I.O. parallelism, which is an important problem. Uh, if you take the source system class, I think they cover this in a bit more detail. But we'll talk about it from a database system perspective from about like, what, does, what can the database know is going on versus what is external to it. So the first thing is fine is, is the database system process model. 
This is sometimes we call it process architecture in different systems. Um, but basically it determines how the system is going to be organized to support concurrent requests from a multi-user application. And so by multi-user, what I mean is uh, you could have multiple uh, things or entities try to request different queries at the same time on our application. Now, this, this could come from either within the application itself uh, or the application could be taking in its own input requests, like if it's a web server, taking requests from the outside and then, uh, then, then passing those requests over the database server. But for our purposes here, we don't really care. And as I said, I'm trying to be, try to be very careful in my language here, but we'll say that a worker is gonna be a computational unit or component in the database system that's gonna be responsible for executing tasks on behalf of the application, on behalf of a client, and then returning the, those results. And it may be the case that the, a single worker is responsible for getting the query request, and then it may split that query request up into different pieces in the query plan to execute in parallel, and then submit those two separate uh, workers. But the, at the end of the day, something needs to produce a single result back to the, to the, to the application for, in, in response to that query. So we want to say that you know, there's a there's a there's a assigned sort of primary worker for the query, but it may use multiple queries, multiple workers at the same time. So there's basically three high-level approaches here uh, of how we can organize the, the system. And the first two are basically uh, very similar to each other. It's just one's gonna use processes, and one's gonna use use native OS threads. Um, but then the last one is an embedded database, and, and this one is super common, and I just want to cover that a little bit. But it's not, how do you say this? Whether this is not actually a process model or not, um, it depends on, in my, my opinion, this is a common use case of a database system, uh, the embedded approach. So we just we're gonna cover that and understand, that, understand the implications of it. So the process per worker is exactly as it sounds. So each worker in our database system is gonna be a separate OS process, meaning we're gonna call fork uh, when the system starts up and starts a bunch of worker processes, and there's gonna be some coordinator or, uh, or what we'll call a dispatcher, and Postgres, they call this the postmaster, um, but it's responsible for knowing, here's all the processes I forked, uh, and keeps track of you know, whether they're alive or not. So now when the application, assuming this is external to the, to the database system, it submits a request to connect to the database system, so assume this gray box here is our database system process, um, so at a high level, it may contain multiple processes. And then for the database part here, I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's running on the same box on the local disk, but doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be, could be a remote disk, but we don't need it. We don't care about that right now. So the application says, I want to connect to the database system. It first hits up the dispatcher process. Um, and then the dispatcher process is responsible for picking one of its worker processes to say, you're now going to be the in charge of this query uh, or this, this connection. Um, the dispatcher hands off that information back to the application, who then then connects directly to the, the worker process uh, and submits any query request to that, who then executes that query on behalf of, of that connection and does whatever it needs to do on the database system. So there's a couple things here about this approach, um, why it's sort of, I say, it's less than ideal. Um, and this is a sort of remnant of the of the days before the, the, the dominance of Linux um, and, and, and POSIX and pthreads and so forth, right? So the first is that the, it's gonna, we rely entirely on the operating system to do scheduling. We can play games with the priority flags in the OS so that maybe some one process gets a, has a higher, lower priority or higher priority than another. Um, but I don't think any system really does that. And you really can't control uh, and the dispatcher is not going to control, okay, you guys, every, everybody stop executing because I want this process to take, take control. Everybody's sort of doing their own thing. Um, and we have to use shared memory to, to maintain global data structures or do some kind of IPC or memory or message passing between processes in order to keep track of global state, like a buffer pool, uh, for example. And so that, there's a bit more you know, overhead to do that unless you're using shared memory, which is what, what Postgres does, and I think all these other systems do. One advantage of this is that if now some process goes off, goes off the rails and, and crashes, or does something wrong, divide by zero, and kills itself, or crashes, seg vaults, 
you don't end up actually taking down the entire um, uh, entire database system because that crash is isolated to, to that process. So that aspect of, is kind of nice. Um, but obviously, if we were just careful programmers, we would avoid you know avoid divide by zero in, in our database system. So I, what I was saying that this is sort of a remnant of the old days, the 1980s and 1990s, before Linux became you know what it is today. Because um, you typically see this in, in older systems, like DB2 from the 80s, Oracle's from the, the 70s, Postgres certainly the original version of that's from the, from the 70s, or sorry, the 80s. Um, and so the reason why these older systems use the process per worker model is because it was before P threads became sort of standardized. Like all these different variants of Unix that was out there, was BSD, uh, Solaris, or SunOS, uh, HPOX, um, True64, there's all these different versions of Unix you may have never heard of, and they all had their own different uh, native thread packages. And so it was a huge, and had different semantics of what, it, what would happen when you spawn a thread. Um, and so if your system needs to support a bunch of different environments, you're better off using fork because that's something everybody pretty much implemented. Um, and then you didn't worry about the, you know, the threading stuff because of the sort of complicated things. Because it was different from one system to the next. Um, so what is more common is the thread per worker model or multi-threaded database system instance. And that's where you have a single process with its own internal multiple worker threads. And these are typically implemented as uh, preemptive native uh, OS threads. And so for the most part, this now means the operating system, or sorry, the data system is gonna manage its own scheduling because it has full control of what thread is, is doing what, I mean, within, within some reason. Um, and you may or may not use a dispatcher thread in the front. You could have, uh, you could have a single thread uh, you, you could have a single dispatcher thread take the request and then immediately forward it to another thread, and then the outside application doesn't know it needs to re reconnect to something else. Or you could have uh, do the similar approach that I said before, where the application connects to the dispatcher, it gets assigned a worker thread, and then the dispatcher t communicates directly with that thread going forward. Um, it's basically, you know, do you want a thread pool uh, that any that any thread could potentially execute any query for any connection, or do you want a dedicated thread per connection? Uh, there's pros and cons of each of these. So pretty much every database system that's been built in the last 20 years is going to be using this approach. Um, SQL Server does this. Uh, DB2 actually supports both process model, the process worker, and, and thread workers because you know they have to support different these various you know these Unixes and, and, and Linux versions that uh, or Unix versions that uh, you know that maybe other open source systems don't have to support mainframe stuff as well. Um, Oracle added support for uh, multi-threading uh, instances in, I think, version 12, which came out in like 2014. Um, MySQL does this. Uh, there, we, I'd say at CMU, we did hack up Postgres in 2015 to make it multi-threaded. Don't recommend it. I forget why we did that. Uh, but, it, you know, it can be done, but there's, there's still strictly a, a single process model or pro process per worker model. Um, the... The only systems in the last 20 years that don't do this approach uh, is anything that is a fork of Postgres. The one system I want to talk about that's fairly interesting, I think, that does this approach is, is, is SQL Server. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on how they do scheduling. So for each query plan that shows up, I mean, this is not just for SQL Server, this is for everyone uh, that is trying to do as much fine-grained scheduling as they can for workers. Um, they're going to have to, the systems are going to decide like how many tasks should it use, how much should it, should it paralyze or break the system, break the query plan up, uh, which CPU cores it should use for the workers, like, how, like um, and then uh, where the CPU cores actually are. Um, this is only if you care about NUMA. Um, not every system does. Certainly my SQL and Postgres do not, but the SQL server definitely does. Um, and then where should the output of the, of the query go? or the, sorry, the, the operator go. But we talked about these inmate results that we'd write out to, uh, to a potentially a buffer as, as we, we potentially emit them up into the query plan, but it may be the case that since we know that one, the next operator will be executed on this core over here, maybe we want to write to memory that's local to, for, uh, for that core instead of our own local memory. These are some things we won't really talk about in the, for this course we talk about in the advanced class, um, but I'll generally
the data system is always going to know way more than uh, than the than 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 the operating system, and so we don't want to allow the operating system to make any of these decisions if we if we can avoid it. And again, the commercial guys do much better at this than the open source guys. So I said the one I want to call out is on SQL Server because I think their architecture is the is probably the, the most fascinating of, of all of these. Um, so in 2006, 2005, um, SQL Server rewrote their entire execution substrate um, into a new abstraction layer called SQL OS. And the idea was basically they want to not have any part of the data system make direct, make direct syscalls to the operating system. In this case, it would have been Windows. We don't, we don't want any part of the system to make direct calls to the operating system. Instead, they're gonna make direct calls or make calls to the SQL OS layer and then it's responsible for then making the appropriate call down to, um, to, the, to, the, to the operating system to do certain things, right? Um, and what they ended up did with, with this, this, as part of this rewrite using SQL OS, is that they switched the code base into uh, a non preemptive threading model where you basically allow the, the threads to yield up, uh, yield their, their execution contacts back to this centralized scheduler in SQL OS that Microsoft implements in SQL Server. Um, and then that SQL OS layer can decide who runs next, where do they run, um, and you know, where's the data gonna be actually gonna be stored or where the data is coming from. And so this is a very, it was a major undertaking for them. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. Um, as far as I know, at least, there are some systems like Fauna that does a little bit of non-preemptive thread scheduling, but not at this level of sophistication that uh, that they, they, they do do this here, right? Um, and so you can think of like, in similar the way we talked about that like the buffer pool is a re-implementation of virtual memory inside of a database system. You can think of SQL OS here as just like a re-implementation of almost the entire OS to do thread scheduling. Um, and so they, they originally did this, this rewrite because uh, they wanted to have control um, where every time that they, they want to have you know, fine-grained control of, of where memory was being allocated, where memory was being uh, written to. And they didn't want to have to, uh, you know, as the hardware landscape changed over the years, they don't have to go back and rewrite or add custom code in all different parts of, of the system to account for new types of hardware. If you just did it at the SQL OS layer, uh, then everything up above could take advantage of it and you just implement that co complexity in, in, a, in a sort of a single location. So the unforeseen advantage of this effort uh, back in 2006, 2005, was that in 2016, 2017, when Microsoft finally added or ported SQL Server to, to Linux, because pr prior to that, it only ever worked on Windows, even though it was, you know, it's one of the most state-of-the-art data systems now, but if you, you could only run on Windows for, Steve Ballmer and, and Bill Gates reasons, legacy reasons. Uh, but in, in 2016, they were able to switch over to, uh, uh, to Linux and now support Linux because of the SQL OS layer. They only had to change those, those syscalls that you would make to Windows to now to make to Linux. And you didn't have to change anything else up above. Now there's the tooling ecosystem, like you know, GUIs and all that kind of stuff. That's, you know, that's not affected by, or that, that can't take advantage of this. And they had to port all those things over. But so the core kernel, the core, core engine of the system was much easier to port because they switched it to SQL OS. So I'm gonna talk about how they're doing uh, the thread scheduling. So in SQL OS, the, they're gonna maintain a uh, application defined, sorry, or a programmer controlled and defined uh, four millisecond quantum. And then they're gonna have their own scheduler that's gonna say, okay, I wanna run things and task in four millisecond chunks. And again, this is not something we can enforce because we're, we're doing non preemptive threading, meaning it's up for the, the implementation, the data system itself to say, okay, it's been four milliseconds, let me go back to the scheduler, let the scheduler figure, figure things out, right? Because we can't, uh, we don't have that kind of, we can't you know, send the signals and do those interrupts the way the operating system can at, at user level for this. And so the way you implement this is you have to add explicit yield calls in the source code uh, in roughly where there's four milliseconds or, or you know, or work being have, have been done, to then go back and yield to the to the to, to the, the, the SQL S schedule. So let's say we have a SQL query like this, select star from R, where R.val equals some input parameter, 
So as we saw last class, if you're doing an iterator model, it's roughly going to look like the query plan is going to look like something like this, right? For every tuple in R, uh, evaluate the predicate. If it evaluates to true, then emit it. And so what, um, what now they have to do to, to do non-preemptive threading is they add explicit yield calls in the source code like this. Um, like it's literally, you have to write it in the source code. It's not some compiler magic you have to do this. Um, and this is a gross approximation, but basically you get the current timestamp, check to see whether it's been four milliseconds since you've last checked the timestamp. If yes, then you yield back to the, uh, do the Siegel West database system thread scheduler. Otherwise do whatever the processing, that, that is, do whatever processing you, you wanna do, right? Again, the idea here is that we have more fine control of how to inter intermix threads there's also additional metadata that, that Microsoft can maintain about who's waiting on what latch or what lock. And therefore, when I yield, I can decide, should I even try to run you again? Or should, do I know you're blocked on, on some lock up above? And again, the operating system can't know this because it doesn't know. It may know about mutexes and, and you're blocking on those, but it doesn't know about the high level locks uh, that the data system is going to maintain, which we'll talk about after the midterm. Um, right. So, so this is way better because now you have complete control of when threads run and when they don't run. And I said, the other two systems that I know that do this are FaunaDB. And as I said, all they really pretty much do is just put a blind yield uh, after like a, a disk read or before they do a disk read. And the idea there is just like, most of the time you're blocking, waiting, getting something from disk. So let me just yield before I, I, uh, I go do that or do, do it again. The one that does do this in a more sophisticated way is ScaliaDB. We had them give a talk uh, at CMU during the pandemic, so probably a year or two ago. Um, and they talked about how they were doing this non preemptive thread scheduling and they instrumented their system, uh, the source code. So, you know, they had to do it Microsoft, uh, you have to put explicit yields, but then they would have um, infrastructure in place to know that if they found a portion of the code of, of a task took more than, you know, their five millisecond quantum time, it would then sort of send an alert to the to the, the, the database system developers so that they can go look and, and see, okay, why, why did we just spend more than time we, we should have in the, for, you know, for, for this task? And then they can recalibrate and move the yields to the right location so that they have, you know, cons cons consistent chunking, right? Because otherwise, without, the sort of that, without so, that sort of instrumentation, you're, you're blindly putting yields and hoping it all works out. So I thought that was, that was a really clever idea. All right, so the last uh, process model I want to talk about and which is again, it's not really, um, how do I say this? I don't think the textbook mentions this as explicit process model. I think it's just worth talking about because it's a different, it's a much different approach of, of how a data system would run than, we, than we've been assuming this semester. Um, so pretty much we've been assuming uh, our data system that runs like Postgres where it's a separate process, either running on the same box or on, the, on, the, or on a remote machine Again, whether it's using a process per worker or thread thread per worker doesn't matter, but it's some separate some separate process from the application, and that we're going to connect to it using using TCP or Unix sockets, whatever we want, and then we can issue queries and get, get responses back, right? Um, and then when our application dies or goes away, the data system is still running, right? Sort of a client server uh, model. But another common approach is just called what is what, what is called an embedded database system, where the database system itself is going to run in the same processor, the same address space as the application. And therefore, when the application makes calls to the database system, it's responsible for having the whatever thread that it makes the call is, is for actually going executing the query or executing whatever, whatever the, the, doing whatever the task it needs to do on, on the, the database system. Um, now, I say mostly responsible for thread and scheduling because the, there are some embedded systems uh, I think like DuckDB, where you it can you can it's an embedded system, embedded database system, but it can spawn its own execution threads, so you get parallelism uh, that way, and that are separate from the application threads. Um, but for our purposes, the main idea, the main purpose is like it's running in the same same address space is the main thing we care about here, right? So the application could have multiple threads, and each thread could just, you know be responsible for executing some queries. So I mentioned DuckDB. The other two most famous data systems that work this way is SQLite and RocksDB. Um, right? When you connect to SQLite through the command line, the, that SQLite client is the, th is the thing that's actually the application that's actually running a data system. Right? You just happen to do it through, through their terminal interface. But you can also embed SQLite in 
it's, it's, it's embedded in, in your web browser, right? So the web browser is responsible for the threads and it, it uh, and it's responsible, it, it knows how to go you know, make calls in SQLite and then SQLite uses those threads to execute queries. Again, there may be additional threads that spawns for par parallel execution, like I said, in DuckDB or background tasks to do um, garbage collection and, uh, and other things, right? Um, the, probably the, the SQLite is probably the most famous one, the most widely deployed embedded database. It's actually the most widely deployed database in general. Um, but it's not the first embedded database. The first one probably is, I think is Berkeley DB from the late 80s, early 90s. Oracle bought them in 2006. Think of it like it was a embedded key value store, like a hash table, but they also had B plus trees. Um, embedded databases are also, also common in systems that then build uh, a sort of a more traditional client server architecture on top of that. So MySQL, for example, their embedded engine is called InnoDB. Um, that's their B plus tree, you know, index organized tables uh, implementation. And then MySQL, sort of this, this uh, the client server layer above it. it has the, the SQL parser and the, and the optimizer and all that stuff. Um, and so the InnoDB doesn't fork its own thread, it's responding its own thread as far as I don't know, but it, MySQL up above does that and that gives them to InnoDB. Um, CockroachDB did this with, with RocksDB. There's a bunch of systems that do this where they take an embedded system that doesn't have its own process model um, or maintain its own threads and they build a, a larger system on top of it. Okay, so um, I've talked about the, the pros and cons of multi-threaded versus uh, multi-process architecture. And again, pretty much every system in the last two decades, or 15 years, is, is using the using native OS threads. Um, there's less context over switch between threads. You have more complete control over what thread one runs and where. Um, and so, you know, if you're building a system from scratch today, the multi-thread approach is the way to go. Now, just because your data system supports multiple threads or multi-thread multi workers, or sorry, using multiple workers or multiple threads uh, on multiple threads, it doesn't necessarily you, you mean you support intra-query parallelism, which we'll talk about next. Meaning, just because you have multiple threads running doesn't mean a query can show up and the data system is, will be able to break it up into multiple threads or, or execute it in parallel multiple threads. Um, so MySQL is the, the best example of this. It's a multi-threaded data system architecture, but one query shows up and it'll be only executed by one thread, right? Because that's, that's, that's the model that they, they, they pursue. All right, so let's talk about the different types of uh, parallelism, parallelism we have at the sort of query level. Um, so I already mentioned intro query parallelism, right? This is where we take a single query shows up and we can break up the, the operations to, uh, to multiple workers and run those in parallel. And this is super common in OLAP systems where like, you know, I want to scan a large table, I can break up the scan uh, into separate workers and have them run in parallel at the same time. Um, Inter-query parallelism is, is the most common one. This one pretty much everyone does. This is where the system itself can support m multiple simultaneous active queries running se on separate workers at the same time. And obviously, as always, we want to do this because we have uh, increases throughput and, and latency. Um, so I'll briefly talk about inter-query parallelism, but um, we'll spend more time talking about it after the, the midterm because we need to worry about correctness of two, two workers for two separate queries, update the same thing at the same time. How do we deal with that? Uh, but we'll spend most of today talking about inter-query parallelism. So inter-query parallelism, as I said, it's multiple queries running at the same time, like two different requests show up and we want to run them, run them at the same time. So if everything's read-only, then this is really easy to do because uh, they're not going to change the state of the database itself. They may change the state of internal data structures, like our buffer pool, um, like you update the page table and so forth, or any internal statistics that we maintain. But the underlying core database itself, is, it, for the most part, is not going to get modified. Um, so we, this, is, this is pretty easy to do. So we do use all the latching stuff to protect the data structures, but we don't have to do any higher level locks to protect uh, the database itself. But then if they update the database at the same time, then this is where things get really hard, um, you know, equally as hard as, as maintaining the uh, parallelism in the data structures. Um, but as I said, we're not going to cover this right now. We'll cover this in lecture 15 af after, the, uh, after we get back from the, the midterm. Again, so there's not really much to say here that like, I could have, uh, as I showed before, application issues, uh, different application instances issue different connection requests. The dispatcher could assign them to different workers. 
uh, and whether it's a thread per worker or, or process per worker, doesn't matter. And those queries are run in parallel and they have to contend for resources um, on the buffer pool and other parts of the system. And we sort of make sure that they're doing this uh, in, a, in a safe manner that doesn't corrupt our data structures. So integral query parallelism is what people, most people think about when they say parallel execution in a database system. And the idea is that for a single query invocation, we're going to execute its operations or operators in parallel at the same time. And so this is going to be similar to, I mean, if you just think about the, the, the processing models we talked about last class, iterator model, vectorized model, uh, and then the um, materialized model, where like the, it's sort of this pub sub or producer consumer model where we could have different operators of producing results to different parts of the query plan. And there could either be a worker, you know, uh, multiple workers for each of those, those query, query operators uh, running in parallel, or the, the, the different operators could be assigned to different workers and they're feeding to each other, right? But the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, the producer-consumer model makes this all uh, easy to do, with easy with reason, but to, to expand the or extend the query plans into to support parallel execution because we have that decoupling and a well-defined API of what, what one operator sends to another operator. At a high level, we're just saying it's, it's emitting tuples. And obviously, when I talked about SQLOS, you care about the location of where, where, the, where the results are being sent. But for, for our purposes here, we, we can ignore that. So the, for all the query, uh, sort of the operator algorithms that we talked about so far, there's going to be parallel versions of all of these. Um, and sometimes they're like completely parallel because you know, I, can run, you know, I can run the scan in parallel on, on a table and I don't need to pass information from one you know, scan invocation to another, right? Other times you do care about the, the results of the different operators. Like when you care about knowing about the global state of something, like you're trying to find distinct keys, maybe you need to know, you need to know what, the, what are the distinct keys coming out from different operators running at the same time so that you can coalesce them into a single uh, distinct list or sync, distinct set. Um, but, and we'll get to that in a second, but like the, the basic thing here is just to point out is that the, the output of the, the operators can be done in parallel and they can either write to unique buffers or unique locations, or they can write to a single data structure. We'll see how to do this in, in both cases. Um, but at the end of the day, the result of the query itself needs to be a single, uh, a single result that's sent back to, to the client. As I said, we write SQL, we don't know, we don't care necessarily that the query is going to run in parallel. We just want to make sure that we get a result back in the, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a single set or a single relation. All right, we don't want to get, you know, we don't want to be told, hey, here's, here's the results, here's half the results, but here's the location to find the other results. Nobody would write their application code like that. So the data system has to produce back a, a single coalesced result. So, it's easy to conceptualize how to do parallel versions of all the algorithms we talked about so far. So I just want to show sort of a high level how you would do this for uh, the parallel hash join. Um, so the, you know, we talked about before that you would have this uh, first phase where you, the, the, the build side and the probe side, they're both going to scan through the, the, the result and hash it and, and produce the, write, the, write the tuples into buckets based on the hash key, right? But then now an easy way to parallelize this would be uh, for each level of, of buckets, I could just have another worker be responsible for taking the build side and the probe side and neither doing the, the, the nested loop join if it's in memory or build a hash table on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, probe, the build side and then probe on the right side, right? So each worker could be doing this uh, for a distinct level of buckets in parallel. Um, the alternatively, you could be when, when you hash everything together, uh, if everything fits in memory, you sort of, you know, do the scan in parallel on the build side, build, build a single uh, global hash table. And then on the right side, you can then probe that in parallel with different, uh, different workers. And because you're not modifying the state of the hash table on the probe side, you know, they can run that in parallel without any latching and that'll be fast, right? So again, the, the, the tricky thing is the coordination between the different workers. Um, but it's, again, it's not hard to see how you could, you could, you could run these in parallel. And the decision is whether you want to produce a single output uh, result or split them up and then maybe coalesce them later. All right, so for intro query parallelism, there's gonna be three types. Well, 
in my opinion, there's two types. There's intraoperative parallelism with horizontal uh, parallelism and then interoperative parallelism, with vertical parallelism. I think the textbook refers to a third type as bushy parallelism. Um, and in my opinion, it's just a combination of the two. So I don't really see that as a distinct uh, type of intraquery parallelism, but we'll just, we'll go through and make sure we, under, we understand what's actually going on. Um, and again, the, the, the advantage of SQL is because it's declarative, we don't have to write anything in our SQL statement to make it use any of these things, right? The data system is responsible for figuring out, okay, these are the resources I have. My data looks like this. My query looks like this. Here's the best, here's the optimal way to configure the query plan to use these different types of, of parallelism, right? And the spoiler I would say also too is that the, the first approach, the horizontal parallelism, this is probably, this is the most common one you see in, in parallel database systems. All right, so in the first one, uh, the idea is that we're gonna decompose an operator in our query plan into what I'll call independent fragments, or so query plan fragments, that are gonna perform the same function, the same operation or operator uh, as, as the other fragments uh, within the same operator. Um, but they're going to do it on disjoint subsets of the, of the data or whatever, whatever the, the data coming up from, from below it. Now it could be a table scan. So we're, we're breaking the table up into two shards or partitions and every, every query fragment is going to operate on, on just its shard. Um, or it could be coming up from, a, a, an operator below us and we can split that up and everybody operates uh, separately. So to make this all work now that we're going to introduce a new sort of synthetic operator in a query plan called the exchange operator um, that we're going to use to coalesce and split results from either multiple children uh, together and produce a single result or take a single result and split it off to, to multiple parents up above us. Um, so again, this is not something that exists in relational algebra. This is something we're going to introduce, the data system is going to introduce in the physical query plan to allow us to uh, to, 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 you know, to reason about what our degree of parallelism and, and where the data is actually coming in and where is it going out, uh, these different steps, right? Um, and as I said, Postgres is gonna call this gather. They're gonna do the first type of interoperative parallelism, uh, intraoperative parallelism, but something like SQL Server, a more sophisticated system is gonna have uh, support basically all, all three types. So let's see, I really see most of this. So say, you know, I have a table with, with you know, a billion tuples, a, a ton of tuples, and I want to do select star from A where A.val is greater than 99. Um, and assume I don't have an index here. So the query plan is pretty simple, right? At, at a logical level, it's scan A, do the filter on, uh, on value. Um, and so what I'm going to do is for all the different pages I have in my table, I'm going to divide the query plan up into, for, for the scan operator with the, with the filter into to a, a fragment, right? So the fragment's gonna do some scan on a portion of the table A and apply the filter, and then it's gonna feed this up into this exchange operator. So the thing of the exchange operator is like a barrier that says, I can't proceed, or I can't send anything up above the next step in the query plan, uh, to, you know, next level in the query plan tree until I get all the results from my, uh, from my children operators below me, right? And it's responsible for, for saying, okay, I. You know, I, I have three workers and I have three, three plan fragments. So let me, let me assign the, the plan fragments to these different workers and let them run at the same time. So now when I call next on the exchange, assuming we're doing iterator model with top-down execution, I call next on exchange that can calls next on the, on this one plan fragment that on the, on the filter, then calls next on the scan on A and it's responsible for going and, you know, fetching the first page. And right? again, there's some bookkeeping that's keeping track of what page this, this plan fragment is responsible for reading. But unlike in the iterator model where it was, it was a sort of blocking call as I go down and call next on, on my children, the exchange operator is allowed to call next on the, uh, on the other children operators at the parallel at the same time. So now my, my three plan, plan fragments are running in parallel, all processing different pages of, of A here. All right, so let's say that the first two plan fragments they finish, um, and we start emitting tuples up at exchange. Now exchange will say, well, I, I know I, sh I should have scanned the, the two other pages uh, in table A, so it can call next on, on A1 and A2 again to have them go you know, start scanning uh, four and five while the, 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 the third query plan fragment finishes up scanning page, page three, right? So again, the idea is that we're dividing the, the, the scan on a large table across multiple fragments 
that are each run in parallel so that we can uh, sort of uh, you know, reduce the time potentially of, of the query execution of doing the scan because we're not blocking waiting, uh, you know, the worker's not blocking, uh, well, the worker does have to block and wait when he needs a page, but some other worker could have already the page or needs is in memory and, and it can process that and, and, and make forward progress. All right, so this type of exchange is the most common one. It's, uh, it's called the gather operation. Um, I think in, uh, in SQL Server, they may call this the parallelism operator. Um, Postgres calls this gather. The original paper from the 1990s that described this approach, um, it's actually the volcano paper that we talked about many times before. You know, they call this exchange and that's, that's their, their term. But this actually distinct between these different exchange operator types, this actually comes from, from SQL Server because they, you know, as an enterprise system, they support these different types. So this is the most common one, gather. We're basically taking the uh, results from multiple workers and you're gonna uh, coalesce the results and produce a single output stream to whoever needs it up above. So going back to my example here, since the, I need to produce a single output result to the, to the query, or sorry, to the application for the query, the exchange operator is gonna combine them and then, and then shove them up. So this, this is what gather does. The next one is to do distribute, uh, and this is where we're gonna take a single input stream from our child operator, and then we're gonna break it up according to some partitioning scheme, uh, round robin, hash partitioning, range partitioning, we'll cover these later, but you basically take the single input stream and then you break it up to disjoint subsets and you send that out to different consumers up above. And then repartition is the combination of the first one and second one, where you take multiple input streams coalesce them, and then produce uh, multiple output streams. And the key thing to point out here in, in, in repartition is that the number of inputs uh, into our exchange operator do not, does not need to be the same as the number of outputs. Right? I could have a lot of parallelism uh, in, in my input, but maybe I only want to have you know, two, two workers process the outputs. So I'll, I'll split it up to, to divide it up to two, two workers. So again, as I said, the first one is, is the most common one. Uh, the the second two are again are typically seen in the in the in, in enterprise system and any system that's really focused on on OLAP performance uh, will do these other two. So let's say now we want to do our scan on A. Uh, we have three workers that are doing this for this fragment here. Um, we're also going to push down the uh, the filter before the join for obvious reasons that we talked about before because we don't want to do we don't start doing. You know, hash table probes or building hash table for tuples that are never going to match anyway. So we want to get the filter to be close to the scan as possible. Um, we're also going to do an optimization where we, we push down the projection because we would know that these are the only tuples we're going to need uh, at some later point in the query plan. So rather than us copying the whole tuple, assuming we're doing early materialization, we've just copied the subset of the data that we actually need. And then we're going to, we're going to build our, our hash, hash table here. So we'll have exchange operator up above because we want to uh, we want to coalesce the hash tables together into, or assume we're building a single giant hash table for these three plan fragments. So we don't want to start doing the probe until we know our, our hash table is fully populated. Right, so then this feeds into the, the build side of our hash, hash join. So now we do the scan on B, same thing. We're going to do the projection push down, uh, the filter push down and the projection push down. And then now we're going to probe the same hash table that was built uh, by, by the other side. And again, this will not get invoked until we complete the build side, which is blocked by the exchange operator. And then now the output of, um, uh, of these different threads doing the join, they're gonna to write to their own individual output buffers. So we can put another exchange operator up above that to then coalesce the results into a, a, a single output, All right? And again, this exchange is just internal metadata that just denotes in the query plan that it can't do anything up above until it knows the task below it and completes. And where the metadata is to say, uh, like, well, the, what determines the amount of parallelism you're going to use uh, when you execute the query, that's typically done before you start executing the query. Like you're, the data system is not going to say, oh, well, I could use more threads while it's running and, and start giving you more threads. Some systems do that. Uh, Postgres does not. SQL Server does not. Typically, there's like, you define the amount of parallelism you want uh, when the query plan is actually generated. Some systems like Snowflake can recognize that, oh, I'm running slower than I should, and they actually can pull in, they can borrow workers, uh, and, and you know, not only from, from your cluster, from they have this sort of global pool of available workers, and they can pull in workers to speed things up for you 
um, I think if things are going slower than, than they had anticipated, which is kind of cool. All right, so interoperative parallelism, uh, this is vertical parallelism. And as I said, this is, uh, this is not as common in uh, what, what I would call traditional data warehouse uh, uh, OLAP systems. You typically see this in what are called streaming systems or continuous query systems, things like Spark Streaming, uh, Apache Flink, Pulsar, KSQL DD, which is it runs on Kafka. And the idea here is that you're going to have uh, you're going to have assign a worker to an operator, um, and you know, sort of one operator, one worker per operator, and so that operator can just sort of run all the time on any tuple that arrives. And when it produces a uh, an output, it emits that to a next next operator. There's some other worker that could pick that up and process that because there's always going to be some other work that that you you know that each worker is going to keep doing. Um, and the reason why this is common in streaming systems, and because uh, the idea is that I'm connecting to some event source or some source of data that's always sending me new data. And so rather than like run the query like in a batch mode where like I run previous result and then new query shows up and I, on a second let I run it again, these things are just they're running all the time. And this is also called pipeline parallelism because again, within a pipeline, uh, you, you have multiple workers running in parallel at the same time. All right, so let's say we, in, a, in a real simple example like this, we have this join operator here. And let's ignore what we talked about before, where we parallelize that uh, with multiple workers doing the scan. Assume that there's just one worker that's responsible for taking any, uh, any tuple gets um, from, from the, the inner table, if you build the hash, the, hash, the hash join or hash table, and just keeps emitting it, right? So this thing is just always running on one worker and it's, and it's emitting tuples um, like this. And then the up, up above it, it's gonna be another worker to do the, the filter and then it just sits and listens on some incoming stream and says any tuple that shows up, apply, uh, you know, up, apply my projection and then spit it up, right? And so the idea is that this incoming queue or, or input stream is or socket is is, is 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 there's no new result, then this worker is just idle and it waits, right? And again, the idea of a continuous query is that this thing just say you're trying to say, you know, uh, do an alert on the stock price, so you want this thing running all the time as new ticks, new stock ticks come in. So you, each worker can be doing a piece of the query plan, uh, we're always running parallel. All right, the last one is the bushy parallelism that I talked about before, which again, I, my opinion is just a combination of both intra and inter-operator parallelism, um, where you have different workers execute different multiple operators in different parts of the query at the same time. Um, and you still need exchange operators because you, you have to combine things and put things together, but again, at, at a high level, it works the same way. So now we have, say, a three-way join, or sorry, four-way join between able to, table A, table B, table C, and D. Um, so with bushy parallelism, I could break it up so that like the uh, the join on A and B is done in one worker, the join in C and D is done in one worker, um, and then these are producing outputs that are then running um, running uh, to do the join on, on the intermediate results between, between all of them. Everything we talked about so far is about getting parallelism for uh, across CPU cores. Um, and the problem there is that is that it may be the case that the, the CPU isn't the bottleneck, right? It's actually the disk. So if I have you know I have a, a CPU socket that has a thousand cores, uh, and it's great that I can run you know using the different types of parallelism we talked about. I can run all my my my, my workers on different cores at the same time. But if they're all end of the day going to the same disk and that's super slow, then <coughs> all my additional parallelism is for naught, right? It's, it's, it's a waste. It's actually, I, I could get poten <coughs> potentially worse performance because um, now it is, everything is just, you know, the, the system disk is just thrashing, bringing things in and out of memory nonstop, right? So what we also potentially need in our data system, what we do need in our database system is IO parallelism, right? So that we can split the, the database itself, uh, the things that we're actually storing across multiple devices, non, multiple non-volatile devices, multiple SSDs, or if we're running in the cloud, you know, multiple S3 buckets. Because um, this is gonna allow us to improve our, our disk bandwidth quite a, quite a, quite a bit. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this, like we can have you know, uh, one database could be comprised, stored across multiple disks. 
one you could have one database per disk and you have multiple di multiple disks and one, one per database uh, you could have assigned one table one relation per disk you could split a relation across multiple disks right all the different approaches have different trade-offs and not not only in terms of both performance but also reliability or, or durability um, like if one disk goes down do i lose everything or do i lose part of it right um, and so we're not going to get too much into that now. I just talk about from, from a database system perspective what we need to actually think about for this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about this when we talk about dist distributed databases. So I will say that some systems will support this notion of IO parallelism in natively inside of it, meaning the data system is aware that it has multiple disk devices that, that are unique um, and that it can assign tables or assign relations or assign indexes to different disks and it knows now in the disk manager or the dispatcher when, it, when you go fetch a page where you're actually going and getting it um, and then you know potentially also do uh, backups and recoveries according to the topology of your disk layout um, other systems this is this has no notion of different devices right it's, it's just using the file system the operating systems file system api to say create me a file create me directories and it doesn't know where you know what the actual physical storage is for that um, again so Postgres and MySQL work this way, and so it's up for you now in the as like an administrator on the on the uh, the operating system level to then us you know move uh, directories to different disk devices or do sim links and so forth, right? Um, and so that you'll get the par you know, you'll get the benefit of the parallelism in the in the data system because the you know, disk got potentially faster, but the the, the data system scheduler can't take is not aware that these are actually different storage devices and can make different decisions based based accordingly. Um, so this is, this is that approach that I'm talking about here. So this, this sort of, this transparent, uh, parallelism we would have in days of do, do I parallelism. And this is, again, this is probably the most common one. This is what pe most people do to get started. The enterprise things can, can do more complicated things. The basic idea is that we would have at the hardware or the OS level, this notion of multiple storage devices. So from the data systems perspective, I got a bunch of pages on disk, uh, or, you know, in, in my file. But I don't know where this is actually being stored. So this is what you would use something like RAID for. So RAID zero would be uh, striping, where thing would just it was round robin for every page that shows up, you assign it to uh, one one of the disk devices that uh, that, that you set up in your, in your RAID RAID array. Um, storage appliances basically work, work, are doing this the same thing. So striping is 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 one way to get get benefit get better performance because now within you know, so one logical disk view from the data system, it can run requests in parallel and there's multiple devices dispatching and executing these things. Of course, now the problem is in this case, if you crash and go down or one of these disk crashes, disk crash, you lose all the pages there. And so there's also mirroring in RAID where every page is stored on multiple devices uh, in, in, in duplicate. Um, so this makes reads go faster because now you could potentially uh, have different queries read different pages from different disks. Um, it makes the data more reliable because if one disk dies, you have, a, you have backups on the other disks. And again, this is all transparent to the database system. Um, most systems are going to use some combination of like RAID 0 plus 1. So you get the benefit of the, of the striping because that's better for writes because now not all the writes don't have to go to all multiple disks. But then you get the, the benefit of mirroring so that one disk dies and, and you don't lose everything, right? And again, for my purposes, the database system doesn't know any, anything about this. The way, uh, the way to, if the system does need to natively support uh, I/O parallelism, the way you would do this is through through some some amount of database partitioning. And the idea here is that we are taking a some uh, you know some, some level of division in in our in our database to, to then split those split the database up into to disjoint chunks and assign them to different storage devices. So you can, as I said, you can do it on a per database level, per table level. Within a table, you could either do this at, um, at sort of horizontal partitioning or vertical partitioning. Um, again, it's, it's up to the, the data center to decide what's the best way to, to, to get this, to do this and get, get better performance. Um, so if, if you're, in some cases, if you're, if you're, if you're storing everything, um, uh, you know, one database per, per file, one database per directory, this is really easy to do because you just move, move directories around. Um, but 
again, this is, there's pros and cons. The, the, the one that the technique that is super common, especially in distributed databases that, that we're going to hold off and talking about until later is this, the lower level table level partitioning or, or tuple level partitioning where we can split a single logical tuple into disjoint subsets or segments that are then treated separately um, uh, in, in the system. And then the query planner knows how to take the request of the SQL query and route it to the right location where this data is located. Um, and ideally, we want this partitioning to be transparent to the application because we always want it to appear as a single logical table, even though physically it's, it's stored in different ways. Um, but again, sometimes this, this information bleeds out into the application, and we can talk about the implications of that later. So I don't want to go too much detail of this later. Uh, a detail of this right now, we'll cover this when we talk about distributed databases because we don't really need to know this particular, we don't need to know this technique to get through query planning and, uh, and transactions, but we need to know about this for, for scaling out to multiple machines. So again, we'll cover that later in the semester. All right, so that's everything I wanted to cover for parallel execution. Um, as I said, the, the multi-threaded, uh, one worker, so one thread per worker is the most common approach. Um, and then inter-query parallelism, meaning running multiple queries at the same time, is also also the most common approach. Um, the the multi-threaded execution of a query, so intra-query parallelism, that's more common in the OLAP systems because um, you want to scan a lot of data and do things in parallel. So this is again easy to think about but hard to get right because there's a lot of things now, a lot more moving parts in the system, and you have to worry about things that we don't have to worry about before when just okay one query shows up we just run it on a single thread because now we got to worry about you know, what, what fragment's going to run at what time, where do they send data to, who runs first versus others. If we're doing writes, oh, uh, we have to worry about, you know, updating the data at the same time, different, same parts of the same data at the same time. Uh, we've already talked about how to do latching, protect the data structures. Um, and of course, now there's contention on the resources trying to, everyone trying to do, you know, access the disk at the same time. I mean, how do you make that not be a major bottleneck? And again, this is why we don't want the operating system to do anything because, the data system always knows what's going on and can always make a better decision for all these things. Okay. All right, so coming up this Thursday is the midterm exam for you guys. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's gonna cover everything that we've, we've discussed in class up to, uh, and including, up to including the lecture from last Thursday. So this lecture here on parallel execution is not covered, um, but everything prior to that, so query execution one, um, that, that, that is covered. Uh, it'll be the hour and 20 minutes that we normally have in for, for lecture time, and it'll be in a location where, where we're going to have lectures. And then that link here will take you to the midterm study guide. So please go look at that. And there's practice problems in the textbook you could look at if you want additional more feedback. Okay? All right, guys, I got to go. I got to deal with uh, Fat Face Rick and, and this intervention that's not going well. And I'm flying back tonight, and I'll see everyone at the exam on Thursday. See ya. <laughs>